I do think the right response and the one that makes the most sense is that he's Lord. He actually conquered death. He actually rose from the grave. He actually did miracles. And he actually is God. You should be interacting with people that require patience. When it comes to like evangelism, tell people about Jesus, we go, we gotta close the deal. We gotta do it. What if they get hit by a car on their way out? But listen, we have to trust the Holy Spirit. You're a bridge builder. You're not responsible for their salvation, but you're building a bridge from your heart to theirs so Jesus can walk across that bridge, but your job is to strengthen the bridge. Wow. Wasn't that a great week last week? It was a powerful week. If you weren't there last week and you didn't see it online or whatever, you go back and check out that message. We talked about doubts. This whole series is asking questions for a friend, you know, like, yeah, my friend has a question. Well, it could be that way, or it could really be that people are asking you questions. And man, sometimes people ask me questions. I'm going, man, I wish I would have known the answer to that one. I just have to say, I don't know. And so what we're doing is a couple of months ago, we asked everybody in the church, anybody who had a question, or if your friends asked you a question, something you want us to talk about, you could uh, submit a question. We had hundreds and hundreds of questions come in. And uh, what we did is we kind of just arranged them into categories. And this week, this was, uh, Peter, the biggest, uh, the second largest group of questions on mental health issues. So yeah. in the spirit of you getting to ask a question for a friend, I get to ask for answers from a friend, okay? <laughs> so if we're talking about mental health, I brought in a mental health expert. I brought in Peter Pignon, who's not only an elder at our church, but he's a licensed counselor, and he is our guest today. Would you give him a big hand? Love you. I say you're a guest. It's not yeah. like you're a guest. I mean, this is your church. My home. I love you guys. Yeah. Man, I'm so glad you're here today. I love you, respect you, and just excited uh, to have you here today. And this first, man, the first service was just amazing. And I believe God's going to open our hearts today and touch us. Too. In fact, I just thought, before we get into it, why don't I just say a prayer for us? We've been praying a lot, but this would be a good one. Why don't you pray that God speaks to your heart, whatever the Lord wants to say to you, okay, God? Our hearts are open to you. Yes. Speak to each person. I pray against any distractions. I pray against anything the enemy wants to bring to people's minds that would hinder them from truth. And I pray your grace and your love be extended in a powerful way, just like there was a prophetic word, a vision that just came to somebody in the service, that you're walking around this room to each one, and you're saying, you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you, I choose you, I bring healing to you. What you're looking for is in me. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that that would be a real realization in every heart and in every person, not just in this room, but online as well. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. Well, let's start with the first question. Yeah, let's, let's just get in into here. it because we go. got so much, okay? Yeah. First question on the screen. Is it a sin to be depressed and have anxiety? And I think I know where this question is coming from because yeah. Philippians 4, 6 says... Mm -hmm. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but in yeah. everything by prayer and supplication, make your request to God. Sometimes the enemy can take the scripture and, and mess with you a little bit. Like yeah. if it says, don't be anxious about anything, then that means if you have anxiety, you're in sin. Yeah. And I don't know that that's exactly what that passage was talking about. It was, yeah. you know, there's a difference between anxiety and perhaps having a worry or a fear. And, and that's kind of giving us instructions of yeah. take it to God. Yeah. And uh, so talk, what, what is your take on that? Let's just start out by saying no. Okay. It's, it's not. It's not. I think that this has been one of the greatest deceptions in Christianity for too long. That mental illness is not real. That we can go without treatment. And we just want to clarify that that's not because of your individual sin. Where does it come from? It comes from original sin. We've all sinned and we've all messed up. 
We've all missed it. So when you're talking about original sin, you're talking about Adam and Eve. Yes. So all Adam and there. Eve, in the very beginning of the Bible, they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. And in the sin, God said, if you eat of that tree, if you disobey, then you, there will be death. And yes. that's not just talking about like physical death. It was spiritual death. It was separation from God. That's where sickness, disease, there's this curse that comes, you know, the scripture talks about. Yeah. And with sickness and disease and death, there was none of that before then. Yeah. In the same way, anxiety fear, worry, uh, depression. These things come into that category from yeah. original sin. Now, let's put it this way. I was talking to Peter earlier. I said, it could be from sin. If you like robbed a bank and then you're scared to death that somebody's going to catch you, how many of you think there might be some anxiety? <laughs> you know, hey, if you have some secret sin and you're nervous that maybe somebody's going to find out mm -hmm. or something happened at the office and you're hoping the boss doesn't find Come on, there's some things that could lead to anxiety and depression yeah. that isn't, but there's, it's not the issue of you can be living for Jesus and living righteous, being a good Christian and having your spiritual life connected to God and still deal with anxiety and depression. The distinction that we make is there's a difference between anxiety and depression being caused by individual sin and being triggered. There so you, you, you might do something that is not God's plan for you, and that can trigger your anxiety and depression. But it didn't cause it. It, it, it was there from was the very beginning. That, that, there's all okay. kinds of factors. Okay, so then that leads us to the next question. Let's go. What causes depression and anxiety? So the, the, these two illnesses and all of the other ones are complex conditions. We're still learning so much about them. So I think it'd be helpful for us to look at some I of the major factors. So we just talked about the spiritual one. That's huge because we want to be connected with God. We, we know innately that we need to be connected to him. And that sin separates us, and it, it leaves us vulnerable to Satan's deception. Mm -hmm. But Satan did not attack the body first. Hmm. He attacked the mind in the garden. You're right. Like he, the enemy came and tempted Eve. It wasn't the physical attack. It yeah. was a deception. He goes over there, uh, and he, he knew what we are learning now, that your mind doesn't tell you what is true, your mind tells you what you believe is true. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you hear that? This is huge. So I'm going to give you another chance to listen to it again. You ready? Go. Your mind doesn't tell you what is true. It tells you what you believe is true. So that could be a false, a false truth. You know, this is exactly what the enemy does. There's this soul wound. There's this thing that happens. It's a trauma, a difficulty, something like that. So yeah. like a, a moment and the enemy brings a lie in. And if we buy into that lie, yeah. we actually have a, a, a false belief. I want you to never forget this, that believe and deceive rhyme for a reason. Huh. Okay. Because that's what Satan does is he wants to, he can't get you to do anything. He doesn't have authority. He doesn't have power. He can only deceive you into doing something. That's, he didn't make them open their mouths and eat the apple or whatever it was. He deceived. The best way that I can explain this so that you'll hopefully never forget is to tell your story. A few weeks ago, I got home, and I'm, I'm just walking in, and I hear this blood-curling curl, scream from my three-year-old Pierce. He's screaming, he's crying, he's got big cheeks, he's got big tears, and I run up the stairs, and as I get halfway up, I see my five-year-old Paxton, and I say, buddy, what happened? Please give it back, whatever, whatever you took from him. Why, what, did you, what did you do? He says, I didn't do anything, and I didn't take anything from him. But all the while, Pierce is losing his mind. So something happened. He's losing his mind. So I go up there, and Pierce is at the top of the stairs, on his knees, holding his arm. He's saying, Paxton took my strongness. Paxton took my strongness. His strongness? I said, buddy, what, what do you mean? What, what, hold on, tell me. He's like, we were playing Transformers. And Paxton hit me here, and he said, I got your strongness. And I looked at him and I said, buddy, Paxton can't take your strongness. You are the strongest. I, his nickname is, Pier, is Piercimo. I said, you are the strongest Piercimo I know. He looks at me. He goes, no, I, don't, I can't. I said, buddy, you are still a transformer. And he says, no, I can't. I said, 
I start making transformer noises. So he goes, and he gets back up. And does that really he, help? Does it, I, I don't know. Like when I'm and down, came, that's what you do. And he came back to the strength that he had. He never lost it. There was physical pain. He, he did get hit for real. But, but this, is the, this is part of the deception, is that even false beliefs can trigger real emotion. Okay? False beliefs can trigger real emotion so that the false belief feels true. Does that keep going down? So you have, you have the false belief, it triggers real emotion, and then he didn't even think to see if his strongness was there. He stayed there behaviorally. He just stood there holding his arm, thinking that he couldn't move. Poor little guy. And that actually triggers in our life when this plays out. Like, yeah. that's a cute story, but in real life, there um, are things that hit us yes. that feels like it's over. It does. It's done. I, you know, Paralyzing. I'm paralyzed. Yeah. Physically, and that impacts our relationships. Our inner circle. Our social. Outer circle. Yeah. And then it can even impact our relationship with God yeah. and that spiritual, because we, shame, doubt, fear, yeah. mm -hmm. all of that stuff, yeah. it really messes us up. So it yeah. all starts with what's happening here, yep. and if we're in alignment with truth yep. or not. You know that God has a vote with truth, and the devil's native language is a liar. The scripture Jesus said, he is a liar and he is the father of lies. Yes. There's no truth in him. Hmm. So the enemy will come with a lie, a false belief. God comes with truth, and you get a vote. Yeah. And whoever you vote with wins in your mind. And so that's why it's so important to know the word and to have people help you yeah. to know truth from God's word because that's where the truth is. Okay, so there is no cure, uh, and this is where it came from, the cause. Yeah. But what do we do? Look at, the, look at the next question here. Is there a cure? Well, I just said it. Is there a cure of depression and anxiety? Yeah. We were kind of talking about Th that. That's where our mind goes. So we, we, we have a desire for the perfect one. We have a desire to be omniscient. That's what the temptation was about back in the garden. So we want to know the cause because we think that the hope is in our cause. And if we can find the cause, then maybe we can find the cure. But our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in Christ. There is not a cure for every disease that is out there, but there is always care. And Paul has this vulnerable moment with us in 2 Corinthians 12, and he talks about having this experience with a messenger from Satan that he compares it to a thorn in his side. And in, instead of letting that message go deep and affect him in all of these ways that we just looked, he took it to God. He says intentionally, God allows him to tell us that he asked three different times for God to take that away from him. To heal him, to cure him, him, get this thing out. Take it out. away. Yeah. And this is what Jesus said to him. If you have a red letter Bible, you'll see that he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Hmm. Just because you have weakness doesn't mean you're weak. Weak makes it sound like you have no strengths, you have no purpose, there's nothing else. But God's power can be made perfect in your weakness. In this world, people will tell you, we just want you for your strengths. But in the kingdom of God, we say, we want you for your strengths and your weaknesses. I want all of you is what the Lord says to you. My grace is sufficient. My grace can be made known to you, and that power can bring out the very best of you, even in the worst of you. I, mean, I think what he's saying here is that if all of us have it all together, then it's like we're doing it in our own strength. Yeah. But when you are weak, in a certain area of your life, if there's an area you're struggling in, and that may not just be weak internally, it may be you're in a weak situation financially, it may mean you're in a weak situation in what's going on in your family, or the circumstance of your life, or your job, or any of these things, how many of you know that when somebody's going through a struggle, but God gives them grace in the midst of it, God is revealed like in a huge way, a bigger way than when you have it all together? So even in this area, yeah. God is showing us he will bring grace to help yeah. us through it, and his perfection is shown yeah. in that, okay? So we, we don't have a cure, but we do have divine care. Divine care. So he gives God us helps care. Us. He will be there. Is there more? He will listen. Yes, there's more. Because we are the body of Christ. 
So how is God going to care for you in your mental illness or whatever it is? He's either going to do it through his being, through the Holy Spirit, the source of truth, or through the body of Christ. So Galatians tells us that we can carry each other's burdens. Hmm. And in this way, we fulfill the law of Christ. I mean, we talk about it a lot. What is the law of Christ? He said there's two things. You love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as you love yourself. How do we do that? We do that by carrying each other's burdens, not putting them on our backs, but helping, helping them lift yeah. it up to the Lord. So God gives us help. Sometimes that's from him directly, like in prayer or something like this, but it's also from us encouraging we need each, each other, other, helping each other. And you know what I call uh, my counselor? I, call, yeah. I use this verse all the time because it says carry each other's burdens. Yeah. And uh, I say I have to go to a counselor because he's a professional burden bearer. Yeah. I mean, he's going to help me with things that I can't get just... Just like my buddy to help me or hey can y'all pray for me on this I need somebody who's kind of can carry heavier stuff yeah. so don't you think that's important it, it's very important and that's why we say it's a three-stranded cord you need the Lord and you need other people you need us we need each other but the last one is we need professionals we need people that have spent time invested time in getting the wisdom to help us I don't cut my own hair I don't fix my own car and when I need a counselor I go get a counselor when I need a doctor I go to a doctor wait a minute you're a counselor. Yep. And you go to a counselor. Yes. And I will for the rest of my life. I'm, I'm making a point. In fact, um, the counselor I go to goes to a counselor. I trust him more in what he does in counseling me because he actually goes and gets counseling himself. Uh, can, I, can we pause for just a second? Go for it. Uh, I, I have told you, if you've been around the church very much, you've heard me say this, but I'm going to just say it again, that uh, I'm in counseling every week. If I'm in town, I'm at, I go to counseling every Friday. Jenny and I go two hours every Friday. I go an hour, and then she leaves, and then I stay for another hour because I have more issues than she does. <laughs> Actually, it's like the, this is like part of the truth. It's kind of funny, but it's part of it is that Jenny and I do counseling, and then she leaves, and then I go, okay, what was that about? <laughs> I'm not sure I totally understand what just happened. <laughs> Give me some clues here. You know, I'm a man. I need help. But it all started like 15 years ago when I was having some anxiety and some panic attacks. And there were panic attacks having to do with being in ministry. Some of you guys, uh, if, if you watched, if you're on social media or news or anything this week, you knew about a guy by the name of Jared Wilson who pastors out in California who took his life this week. And he's a pastor. And you might be thinking, how could a pastor do that? How, what's wrong with a pastor? Let me tell you something. Pastors are people too. And they're in a position of care. And how many of you know, even at a place when you're a person of care, caregiving, how many of you think the enemy wants to take you out even more? So 15 years ago, I was having these panic attacks, all this. I went to, the, uh, and, and Jenny, I said, Jenny, I think I need to go to counseling. She says, I've been knowing that. Just can you hurry up and go, you know? <laughs> but you know what was holding me back? I felt like, how could I be a Christian if I need counseling? There must be, I just need to go pray more. How, how could I go get counseling if I'm a pastor? Who can trust a guy who's supposedly supposed to have the power of God in his life and have it together? And I had to overcome that and say, I don't care about all that stuff. I'm hurting. And let me tell you something. I was at a place yeah. with anxiety and stuff in that, that it hurt. Like my stomach, all of that. I mean, I hurt physically. So I went, and man, the guy, the, the guy I went to, it, it really helped me, man. It really started helping me. And I was like going, wow, this. And you know what I decided? I talk to people all the time, and they'll go, man, I ain't got no problem with counseling. If I ever need it, I'll go. If I'm ever in a crisis, I totally, I think that's cool. You know what I decided? I'd like to go to counseling every single week, whether I'm in crisis or not, so that I can grow and develop. Some people go, man, I'm in a time of good time. Why would I want to screw it up by talking about all those things? Because that's how you get better and stronger for when the next crisis comes, because one's coming. And I want to be better prepared for that moment. I don't want it to be that. Do you understand that I, every week I'm unloading my baggage so that when I get something that really hits me, I can just deal with that issue instead of the 50 other things I'm carrying yeah. that's just exploded because so I hit this. Okay? So it's a, proactive, it's a proactive deal. I'm encouraging you guys. This is such a smart deal to do practically in my life. But there was a time in 2008. 
How many remember the econ economy issue in 2008 and everything that happened with the housing market? It was a pretty big deal that impacted everybody. Well, guess what was happening in 2008? We were building this building that was $21 million. So not only, you know, we're a, we're a giving organization, that's how we pay bills, and so that's, everybody's getting hit. That was struggling. Then our loan organization said, had already approved the whole 21, everything that we needed. And then they came back and said, we're not going to give you the rest of the money. And I'm going, what in the world are we going to do? And so the economies, people are struggling, losing their jobs, different stuff like that. I was carrying that with what was going on with the building. There was health issues in our family. It's like a perfect storm, a perfect storm of stuff. And I remember the day that I went to my counselor and he looked at me and goes, uh, your face doesn't look good. And I'm going... Yeah, that's what I needed to come to you to hear my face looks bad. And he said, no, I'm talking about there's a flat affect. And I didn't, I don't totally know all what that means, but he basically says, we're going to watch that. I'm gonna, let's look at it again next week because I think you're struggling with some depression. I said, I'm not depressed. I'm, right, I'm telling you right now, I'm not depressed. I, I'm praying and I'm praying it through. I'm seeking God and bless God. Hey, Live or die, he's got to handle it. I'm like this. He goes, well, that, that kind of makes me know you're depressed. <laughs> the way you're acting, you're, not, you're trying to act like there isn't a problem. And so he said, I want you to go see this guy, this doctor, or I want you to go see your doctor. So I went and saw my doctor, and sure enough, he, after blood work and everything, it came up that you know, there's different chemicals in your brain, and one of them is serotonin. And uh, my serotonin was really, really low. Yeah. And he goes, no wonder you're not feeling good. The serotonin, the physical brain has been impacted by your stress where your serotonin's low and that causes you to have um, depression and anxiety. And I said, so what do I do to get it up? He said, well, I think right now what we need to do is we need to get you some medicine that can help you on that. I said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you can't put me on no, uh, you know, was it antidepressant or some kind of thing? I mean, that pastors don't do that. Christians don't do, you know, like this. And he goes, really? That's weird. I mean, you've been in my office before and you had a sinus infection and I issued you antibiotics for your sinus infection and you had no problem with that. You came in with this other issue and I gave you medicine. You had no problem with that. So now that your body in the brain area has a problem, you have a problem taking medicine for that? That's kind of weird. And I said... That is weird. That makes sense. Let's do it. And so I tried it. And 10 days later, here's where I, here's normal. And here's where I was. About 10 to 12 days later, my serotonin levels came up and I was normal. Because some people go like, oh my gosh, I got to get some of them happy pills. If that makes pastor feel better, I'll get some happy. No, this isn't like you pop the pills and you're happy. That's not this. This is stuff like you get to normal because you still have feelings and you still have sadness and yeah. you still have, hey, man, I'm worried about the whatever. But it brings you to a place of normal to be able to handle it. And, and I, I just think that's a big deal, especially this last week. I was thinking, man. I don't know what's going on with Jared, but I know his family and I know the church is hurting today. I know he was hurting. Yeah. The guy loves God and all that, but there, he was dealing with this. And I'm just thinking, you know, I just want to give you guys hope. I'm trying to share that with you so that perhaps you would know it's okay. Brings us to this biggest question yeah. of all. I would say this number two most asked question had a version of this. Can someone who commits suicide go to heaven? And we're just going to be honest with you with this one, is that within Christianity, there's different opinions. There's a, it's a broad range. So we have those that say yes, and those that would say yes are saying that when you come to Jesus and you know him and you accept his forgiveness, he forgives all your sins, past, present, future, and you go, you go to heaven. And the people that say no say that, that you don't have time to repent and reconnect with God. And, and I think that a lot of people are arguing about this right now. A lot of people are, are getting lost in this. And I think that there could be an opportunity for deception here. So I just want to be clear. From my perspective, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's a broad range there. But I don't know, but I hope so. Because I think that John 3.16 says that he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to be saved. So some of you are here today, and maybe you've lost someone to mental illness with, by suicide. And we just, I just want you to know that for you, I'm taking the risk and saying, I hope so. I want to lean on hope. I, I, I will lean on love, faith, and hope any day 
over condemnation. And the reason why we're saying I don't know is because the Bible doesn't speak to it in it that way. It. And so from that point, we see the grace of God. So we're talk- we don't know because, yeah. you know, we're not there to see it. So we're leaning on that. So I, yeah. I agree with you. I think that's true. But I want to turn this question a little yeah. bit for a minute in Go this way. It. Because if there's anybody here today that you're making plans or you're in a place where, now listen, I've never, even with the anxiety, I, I kind of hit it up here and have dealt with it proactively. I could see how it could get there. But yeah. my, I've never had suicidal tendencies or, or, or uh, uh, thoughts or plans. Yeah. But I have had feelings like I'm going to bed tonight and I don't really want to wake up tomorrow. Yeah. Hmm. I just don't want to face tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's important that anybody, if you're watching online or you're in here and you're struggling with that, can I just talk to you a minute about this? It's not just about heaven or hell, but how about about, the, about abundant life here yes. on the earth? Is that there is hope for you. God loves you. He is here, and he has a purpose for your life. Right. There is a purpose. And right now, listen, mm-hmm. false belief is you have no purpose. False belief is you're stupid, you're ugly, you know, God doesn't care. Those are the false beliefs that cause you to start planning out physical actions activity that would harm yourself. And let me tell you something right now. God loves you. Yes. He is for you. He has a purpose mm-hmm. for you. There is a calling on your life and the enemy is lying to you to try to take you out and to steal away not only what God has for you, but what God has for other people through you. And I just want you to know there is hope today and there's help and we want to come alongside of you to help you. And that's why I think it's very important that everybody stay total still, nobody moving around. I want you to listen. Because you may look up here and go, man, that Peter. And if you know his wife, Lindsay, you go, they're just perfect. They got everything. They've never had a problem in their life. And I want you to share because I know your story. Yeah. I don't remember a time when I didn't have anxiety or depression. I mean, even as a kid, there was something different that I experienced. I didn't didn't feel like everyone else. And it, it, it just grew as I got older, it got more intense. And by the time I was 13, um, it wasn't just negative thoughts about me, but it was thoughts about dying, thoughts about killing myself. And there were multiple factors. I, I have dyslexia, so even at 13, I couldn't really read. It was, it was very, very hard. And in our country, we, we promote reading, and it's great. I love reading now that I've learned but at 13, I couldn't read. And people said, look, it, what, what are you, stupid? You can't read? What's going on? You know, they would, they would make these comments of me having some intellectual disability. And that made me feel stupid. And I didn't, I didn't realize at the time, but sexual abuse had happened when I was about four or five. And, and social rejection had come. And in my, in my hood, we were all, the, the only people that were popular were those that were good at basketball. And in my church, the only ones that got attention were the ones that were musical. So by all the standards that I could look at, my life was worth nothing. It was a mess. I didn't have a good personality because I wasn't an extrovert. And I got to that place where I said, I'm just, I just need to do this. I just need to do this. I, I need to end my life. And you're 13. I'm 13. I'm 13, and there's so much negativity every day, so much negativity. And then... Something happened. It was like some words came and split the negativity in half. And those words were, I love you. And I had been raised in church. My parents are wonderful pastors, wonderful people. So I knew that that was probably the Holy Spirit. So I just spoke back out loud. I said, no, you don't. You love all those people in church that are perfect and healthy, but you don't love me. And, he's, and the, 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 the words came to me, no, I love you. I love you so much that I gave my life for you. And my grace is sufficient for you because my power can be made perfect in your weakness. And if you give me your life, I will show you what, you, what I can do with a completely surrendered life. Mm-hmm. You're thinking about killing yourself. Well, how about you just give me your life? See what I can do. That when was you, my salvation experience. That's when you gave your life to yeah. at 13. Gave it so, to him. All of it. Which is pretty huge that in the in moments that you were planning to take your life, yeah. the Lord said, give it to me. And you did. Yeah. And did that solve everything? Like, did the anxiety, like when God came in, did his joy make it where you didn't have the anxiety and stuff anymore? 
I smiled for the first time that I can remember after that. I felt so good. I went to youth camp. I, I got called into ministry. I knew I, I had a pa- pastoral, evangelistic call on my life to, to reach the world for Jesus. And I felt so much joy and so much peace because that's who God is. But I still struggled with depression and anxiety. I couldn't figure it out. So I just thought, I just got to keep going. I just got to keep going. I just got to keep going. I end up graduating after learning how to read, of course, go to a Christian university. God specifies that I'm called to do counseling. So I'm at this Christian university. It's seven years later. You're working on a counseling degree. I'm a junior, so I know enough to know that I'm struggling with depression and anxiety, but the depression and anxiety are making me feel like I can't talk to anybody about it. It was isolating me. I, could, I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell my friends. I, I, I was a young adult's small group leader here. But in my mind, I thought that if I shared about this, people were going to shame me. People were going to reject me. That's what the depression and anxiety made me believe. And you even had a counseling center free of charge yeah. in that Christian university right there that you passed by every I day. lived in that dorm. I lived in that dorm. I walked well, by, you and I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, Peter, you need to go in there. Go in there. There's help. And, and in my depressed thinking, I thought, if I go in there, then they're going to share with everyone and, and tell everybody that I have depression and anxiety. I'm going to lose my, de- my, my degree all these years of working. I mean, I had dyslexia. I was happy to just pass my classes. And so, that wouldn't have happened. They would have, they would have helped yeah, me. Yeah, because there's confidentiality. I, I, I know that. They can't go tell. I know that. But that's but, how the enemy was messing with But that's what was happening head. in my mind. And it got to the point where I ended up developing a plan. I just knew that I had lost hope. There, I was too far gone. I learned everything that there was to know about the brain and mind as a junior. And it still didn't help me because I thought it was knowing something. And I went to my sister who lived in Waxahachie. Her name is Heidi. And I just told her, I said, look, I want you to know that I love you. And I want to thank you for always loving me and being there for me. And I want you to tell mom and dad and Jessica that I love them. And then I walked away. She said, wait, 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 wait. Where are you going? I said, I'm leaving. And she chased me. I'm already on the sidewalk. And she chased me and says, Peter, What's going on? Are you thinking of hurting yourself? And when she said that, it broke something inside me. And I just had these angry, emotional tears coming down my face. And she said, Peter, Satan is trying to kill you. And the only way he can do it is by using you. God has a calling on your life. And there's a plan for you. You don't have to believe the thoughts in your head. And I told her, I just, I retorted back. I said, I said, but they feel so true. And she says, even if they feel true, that doesn't make them true. I know who you are. And we went and got Chinese food. (laughs) Because that always helps. The thing that she told me that day that hurt my feelings was she said, Peter, you can't do this to me. You need professional help. And that hurt me. I was thinking, no, 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 just God's being, just the body, my family, my friends, that's all I need. And she said, there is help for you. This is something that's treatable. Yeah. And so did you go do that then? I didn't. What the? I didn't. (laughs) It took me eight years to go to counseling. Because I, what happened, what, is, what had what? happened was, was I ended up getting, I finished my degree, I got my master's degree, and I got, I got hired at that counseling center. I got in the counseling center that I had passed and never got into. The first time I went in there was as a staff member, as a counselor. So then that messed with your head like you can't. I, I, it was too far. I, I, I had this, this secret that no one could know that I struggled with this stuff that I really needed help. It was different telling my testimony about when I was 13, but I wasn't ready to share what I'm sharing right now. Okay, everybody needs to pay attention to this right now. The devil is a liar. Yep. 
He is a deceiver. He's also an accuser of the brethren, the Bible calls him. So he's a liar, and he also accuses you or tell, convinces you people are going to hate you, people are going to reject you, you're going to lose out, you're not any good if you come out. Let me tell you, you know how I know this? He does it to me. I know it personally. Guess what happened this morning? First thing that happened is Peter walked in my office seven o'clock this morning because we were praying for this and we were so wanting to love people and help people. But you know what I said before we got into it? I said, hey, listen, um, put your counselor hat on for a second. I want to ask you something. I feel like um, I've told people about going to counseling, but I've never told them that I took medication and on antidepressant and I don't, I don't want to freak people out like they go like, well, what kind of stupid pastor is he? But I feel like the Lord's telling me to tell people because I think some people are not staying on their medication or going to get medication and they're because the devil just wants to keep them in a situation, you know, and, and I feel like I'm supposed to do it, but I feel like an idiot. Yeah. And we just prayed for a minute mm -hmm. because you know what I did is I risked on the side of vulnerability to say, you know what? I'd rather just be open and tell you what's going on that it might help some people in here than to sit in pride and act like I'm something that I'm not. Yeah. You, yeah. Thank you. So the reason why I'm saying that to you is, guys, don't, don't put this off, man. There's help. Why would you delay it? There's hope. Don't think you can do it on your own. And if it's at that place where you're feeling this stuff... Then go to the, to the counselor, go to uh, the doctor and see all of that. And, and the other thing is like right now, it may be that you feel like it's okay right now, but there's crisis moments in the middle of the night. Yeah. What do you do yeah. with that? I think sometimes we, we want to be able to make those tough decisions when they come and we just think that we'll, we'll know what to do. We can't though. I, I can't even make that. If, if I'm in that situation, I, I promise you, I will call this number the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I'm encouraging everybody, either write it down or get your phone out and take a picture of it. Because you say, well, I won't need that. But you don't know that you, somebody else like Heidi, your sister, that helped you, that you might help them. You need to have this, okay? What is this? They have 24-7 support for anyone that needs to know what the next steps are. You can call. If it's you, you can call, and they'll walk you through the process. But if it's someone else, you don't have to make them call. You can call and say, I'm with somebody, I love them, I don't want them to hurt themselves, help me. And they'll walk you through the process. Some of you may say, and this is why our, our, our wonderful nation developed the text line, is sometimes you're with somebody and you can't take a break to call. You don't know what's going to happen. So the crisis text line is there in the same way. You can text them and ask them what to do and get next steps. They can call the police for you and get 911 there to help you out with that situation. So this isn't a crisis moment that you need it right then. Yeah. But this isn't like you do this every day. This is in that crisis moment. And then after that, it's very important to get that professional burden bearer. Now, what we've done is at a church, as a church, we have a pastoral care team that are incredible. But we also have a group of incredible people like Peter who are professional counselors that are on our list to refer and we connect with them. And so not only do we do that on a regular basis, but because today we knew we would talk about it, it's our heart that I hope many of you are gonna call in the office this week or many of you are gonna email in and talk to Pastor Brian and say, hey, pastor needs it, I need it, you know. <laughs> and, and you can take that step uh, to do that and get help. And we want to do that for you. Okay. And so our prayer team would be across the front. They're always here to pray for you on anything every single week. But then there's the connection, uh, centers that are out there and you can talk to them about how to connect. But guys, we want you to know, we love you. Yeah. We love you. And there is hope and there is help and we'll come alongside of you. There's no shame, just grace. and God will help us. Now, I think that's where just a moment, um, Let's let Peter know we love him and thank him. <laughs> Guys, just hold steady for a couple more minutes here. Can I just tell you this? You notice that today we told you that when you give your life to Jesus, it doesn't mean that all anxiety or depression goes away, okay? But I want to come back and tell you this. There is no real hope 
eternal hope without Jesus. Everything is futile in the sense of dying without that hope, living without that hope. I mean, what purpose is there if there isn't a God, you know, these type of things. And so today, what I want you to know is the beginning of hope is Jesus. Do you know how much he loves you? Do you know how much God loves you? The Bible says that every single one of us in this room has sinned. And by the way, when we're talking about sin today or we're talking about suicide and, and this type of deal, understand we're talking about what is God's best. God's plan never ever includes you taking your life. He has a plan for you, a purpose for you. And let me tell you something, sin is just missing the mark. It's missing God's plan. The Bible says all of us have done it. I have. I've sinned. I've fallen short. What God has me, the Bible says the wagers are the end result of that sin is death. And when the Bible talks of death in this way, it's not just talking about physical death, it's spiritual death. Separation from God for eternity. Not only hell in, that, in the next life, eternity, but it's talking about a spiritual disconnect in this life. To live life without God. The Bible said that that hurt God's heart so much. That he so loved us, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to come to earth to become a man. God took on flesh, humbled himself and came to earth, even to be a little baby. <laughs> but a huge step of love. He lived all of his life dealing with the same temptation we have, the same issues we have, even dealing with anxiety and depression and being confronted with that. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, in the garden, I think anybody who's praying to the point that he's sweating great drops of blood, how many of you think there might be an issue and hurt and a difficulty and a struggle, and yet without, through it all, he never sinned. He was perfect. The Bible says when they crucified him, they nailed his hands to the cross, his feet to the cross. Before they had done that, they took what was called a whip, a cat of nine tails, where they whipped him across his back 39 times. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they mocked him. Oh, king of the Jews. They made fun of him. They punched him in the head and say, prophesy, who was the one who hit you? When they put him on the cross, they began to say, if you're God, come down and prove it. And you know what the Bible says? That by his stripes, we can be healed. By the chastisement that was put upon him, the mocking, the abuse, the mental, the spiritual attack, God says, I've paid that price so you can have peace. And through what God did through Jesus on the cross, the Bible says he poured out, God poured out on his son the iniquity and the sins of us all. Every sin we've ever done and ever will do was poured out upon him. No wonder he cried out and said, God, why have you forsaken me? He, he was feeling that God turned because in that moment, it wasn't just Jesus. He had become our sin. And paying the sacrifice for our sins. And so when he says, God, why are you forsaking me? What is he saying? I feel the disconnect for the first time in all of my eternity. And why did that have to happen? So that we would never have to feel it again. He took his last breath and said, it is finished. Sin has been paid for. They put him in a grave. And just like he predicted on the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave, and all of the powers of darkness. And he said to everyone, now there's a way where there was no way for you to be forgiven of your sins, cleansed of all unrighteousness, for you to become a son of the Father, to become a daughter of the Father, to have a security in your heart that you have eternity with him forever, and to have access to him that in his presence you can have joy where there's sorrow and sadness and to have peace where there's a storm in your life. Listen, he never said you'll be without problems. He just said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world and I'm with you and I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what salvation is about is that we need help and he is the ultimate help. He's our savior. 
If you would stand to your feet and nobody walking around, if you'd stand, hold steady, but stand to your feet, just look right here. I want to ask you, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? If you're not sure, make sure today by surrendering your life to him. The Bible says the way to be saved is to believe in your heart that Jesus is the son of God who died on the cross and resurrected from the dead and to confess with your mouth, he's my king, he's my Lord. And today, if you've not made that decision, if you have not made that decision, maybe you grew up in America, so to you, it's like, I'm a Christian, I'm American. That's not how it works. You're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ. When you make a decision, it's no longer my life that is my own. It belongs to him. I'm not going to, like we, Peter said today, it's not I'm going to take my life because it's mine to do what I want with. I'm going to give my life, and now I'm going to do what he wants and surrender to him. If that's you today, on the count of three, if that's you and you say, Pastor, include me in this prayer. I want to get right with God. I want to surrender my life to him. If that's you, whether you, this is the first time or you have walked away from the Lord for a while and you're coming back home today, this is your moment and I'll include you in the prayer. If that's you, raise up your hand. One, two, on the count of three. Don't wait for anybody else. If that's you, raise it up right now. Three, 